Good morning, church. Good morning. Today we begin our secret journey of Advent, a time of preparation. Lent is in preparation for Easter. It's a time of empty, cleaning out our spiritual closets in order to draw close to God. But Advent, Advent lends itself more to careful preparation for a time, not of us drawing close to God, but of God drawing close to us. Praise God. Praise God. You see, the Christ, God's anointed one, is coming. And the Christ is bringing the fulfillment of promises made long ago. Amen? Amen. Frankly, we can hardly wait. We hear the good news proclaim a world on, excuse me, we hear the news media proclaim a world on fire. We couch our words carefully on social media and even amongst our families for fear of retribution. And we see the vindictive behavior of our leaders and wonder whatever happened to a decent, to common decency. In other words, we need a break from the ever-spinning cycles of conflict and destruction, and our hearts yearn for one silent night. The prophet Isaiah put forth the people of Judah and Jerusalem and set before them a vision. Fascinatingly, even though Judah's sovereignty has been constantly threatened by its neighbors and had watched as its sister nation Israel suffer at the hands of the Assyrians, still Isaiah's vision is not what you might expect. Instead of envisioning a future wrought with revenge on those who have wronged his people, Isaiah hopes for something that has captured the imagination of peoples ever since. Of all the things that Isaiah could have hoped for, Isaiah yearned for peace. Would you say with me, we yearn for peace too, God? We yearn for peace too, God. Let that be our prayer. Come with me then, sisters and brothers, and let's go deeper into Isaiah's vision, replenishing ourselves beneath the refreshing streams of peace. The vision begins with the mountain of the Lord's house, Zion, on which the temple sat. We notice that what is elevated here is not the king's house, not the power of government officials. It isn't the barracks either. Isaiah isn't hoping for a military solution where his enemies are beaten into submission. No, what is elevated for him is the Lord's house. The place where God lives will be elevated as the highest of the mountains. It will be lifted above the hills. The hills were the places where people went to worship the gods of the surrounding peoples. But Isaiah dreams of a time when the world will in fact revere the Lord. He pictured a day when peoples will stream to it. It starts in verse 3. Many nations will go and say, come, let's go up to the Lord's mountain to the house of Jacob's God, so that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in God's paths. Instruction will come from Zion, the Lord's word from Jerusalem. You see, in Isaiah's view, what the world needs now is not another army or better weapons of war. It doesn't need new technology, more land to farm, or access to resources. What the world needs instead is a teacher and people with teachable hearts. What his world needs, what our world needs, are people who are willing to lay down our pride and listen to each other. If the peoples of the earth could just bring themselves to discard their arrogance, their greed, their vengeance, if we would have the courage to walk towards instruction, then perhaps we'd even get to hear it, and God would finally be able to be the Prince of Peace, the arbitrator that Isaiah's vision promised. Amen? Amen. See, God will help us to work it out. And all the more so if we can go to God together. Thank God. What if we went to God and let God help us work it out? What would happen if both parties were open to hear God out? Would we even learn to listen to each other in the process? Common in our vernacular is this phrase from Scripture about beating our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks. But have you ever noticed that Isaiah didn't say that we should just break our swords and spears and go home. Instead, Isaiah tells us to beat them into tools used for building and harvesting. Perhaps Isaiah was trying to remind us that the weapons that we use against one another can be transformed into the very things we need to build peace. In the words of one commentator, <coughs> the ingenuity and skill that divides weapons of war also devises tools and technologies to cultivate rocky soil, to build terraces, and coax forth from the land the nourishment of olive, fig, grain, and grape. Isaiah sees in this same creativity the capacity to transform the machinery of warfare into a technology whose sole purpose is to sustain the life of families 
in God's good land. Anathea 48, 48, yeah. And a couple of months ago, we were in the midst of a worship series about the goodness of all of God's good creation. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Would the Creator throw away any of that? Or would the Lord choose to use it, recycling our weapons into tools of peace to make? Chief among these weapons, our turned tools, I think, would be our deeply seated desire to protect our own. We are fierce defenders of our children, our neighbors, or whomever we consider to be one of us. And I submit that perhaps God will take that Star Wars instinct and transform it into a compassion that can bring peace if we will begin to see the world in terms of all of us instead of one of us, or me and my few. Sure, it's more complicated. And means that we'll have to suffer some hardships as we seek to undergo, under, excuse me, undo greater evils. But there's just something about Isaiah's vision that still compels us. <clears throat> what if we call the truce from all of our sides this Christmas? Liberal and conservative, majority and minority, the privileged and the longing, gay, trans, and straight, black, white, Hispanic, and Asian. All these groups need justice and equity, but to seek peace. We need to turn our spears into walking sticks instead. Like the people in Isaiah's vision who stream to the great arbitrator of our troubles, we need to walk alongside one another in our efforts to build pathways of peace. Just for a little while now, let's leave behind our trenches and meet one another in the middle. Let's listen deeply to each other and dig until we find some common. Let's rediscover our shared needs for dignity, to be valued, to survive, and to flourish. Let's come to Christ's table together with a spirit of unity. And for at least the next few weeks, let's really mean it when we share the peace of Christ with one another, with a dream of reconciliation in our hearts. Let's give ourselves one silent night. We're going to close this proclamation of the word this morning with a dramatic reading. And as we do so, I hope you'll envision the two sides as being whatever issue you're finding yourself currently entrenched in. It could be wars that are raging over a universal issue, maybe one in your local community, one at work or some group you're a part of, or even among your own family and friends. Today, God is calling for us to stream the design for peace, at least for a time, until we need to hammer out justice yet again. Because if we can all learn to listen to one another, I believe we'll be more able to find it. As we yearn for freedom, for peace, may we be like the people Isaiah envisioned. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in a pitch dark land, light has dawned. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. A remarkable story has emerged from the frontline trenches of World War I. Though accounts vary, it seems that in the week leading up to Christmas 1914, groups of German and British soldiers began to exchange seasonal greetings, cigarettes, and songs between their trenches. The unofficial ceasefires allowed soldiers on both sides to venture out into no man's land which was the stretch of terrain between German and British trenches to collect and bury the bodies of dead soldiers. One version of the events has it that on Christmas Eve, the Germans began singing Stille Nacht, or as we know it, Silent Night. The British soldiers recognizing the tune joined in. Some groups of soldiers even finished up with a game of footy or soccer together. Actual letters from British and German soldiers who witnessed the truce give us a glimpse of that Christmas Eve on the Western Front 100 years ago. Here is what some of them said about what happened. The Germans started singing and lighting candles about 7.30 on Christmas Eve. <coughs> and one of them challenged any one of us to go across for a bottle of wine. 
One of our fellows accepted the challenge and took a big cake to exchange. We came from our mouse holes and saw the English advancing towards us and waving cigarette boxes, handkerchiefs, and towels, and had no rifles with them. And that's how we knew it could only be a greeting and that it was all right. We had a church service and sang hymns. We met the Germans midway between the trenches and wished each other a Merry Christmas. We exchanged buttons, badges, caps, etc., and we all sang songs. They gave us cigars and cigarettes and toffee, and they told us they didn't want to fight, but had to. Some could speak English as well as we could, and some had worked in Manchester. The Germans seemed like very nice chaps, who were awfully sick of the war. We were able to move about the whole of Christmas Day with absolute freedom. It was a day of peace and war. It is only a pity that it's not a decisive peace. In a letter sent from the front on December 29, 1914, Staff Sergeant Clement Barker reports that during the truce, British soldiers went out and recovered 69 dead comrades, comrades in no man's land and buried them. Sergeant Barker also reports that an impromptu football match then broke out between the two sides when it was a, a ball was kicked out from the British lines into no man's land. Another soldier writes about how the truce came to an end at 3 p.m. on Christmas Day when a German officer called his men in. <coughs> the German soldier said to me today, Christmas Day, nice. Tomorrow, shoot. As he left me, he held out his hand, which I accepted, and said, farewell, comrade. With that, we parted. Remembering this truce a century ago, isn't just about what happened then. It's about what we, God's children, and the followers of the Prince of Peace can do now in the midst of conflict and fear in the 21st century. What we can do today, right now, this Christmas, to help our families, our communities, our world hang on to our humanity in the face of brutality. What can we do to love one another and to care about those we don't even know. While so much around us shouts at us to hate and fear and give up the real possibilities for peace and reconciliation. How can we meaningfully pray for those we call enemies today as well as, as those who were enemies in 1914? In the same way that British and German soldiers made a human-to-human -human connection with each other by sharing Christmas greetings and singing. Let's take a few moments now in silence before God to reflect on the pathway to peace in our own lives and see what steps the Lord would ask us to take to make peace with someone with whom we are at war. Let us approach the Lord.